This is the Dog Savant Podcast with your host, Brett Endes. Hello and welcome to the Dog Savant Podcast. Today is episode 50. Today we're going to talk about trick training. Uh, what is this show? This is a podcast about dog training, dog behavior. Uh, as for myself, my name is Brett Endes. I am your host and a professional dog trainer here in Los Angeles. I specialize in problem behavior cases, basic obedience, puppy development, uh, training owners, how to better understand their dogs, connect with them better, solve their problems, listen in real world situations. However, today's going to be a little different. We're going to get cutesy. Um, as far as the show, my podcast, thank you for tuning in and listening. Uh, if you're a continued listener, thank you for continuing. If you're a new listener, welcome. And uh, with all that said, I always get, get down to it. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe, uh, subscribe, subscribe, rate, review, share, uh, iTunes, YouTube, all the social media. You can go on at the Dog Savant on Instagram. Facebook, all that good stuff. Support me, support the show. It gives me motivation to keep doing this. Uh, you can go on Patreon if you want to give me financial motivation. It's patreon.com backslash the dog savant. T H E D O G S A V A N T. Uh, but really, why I do this is because this stuff works in the real world. It applies, and many, many unrelated people tell me that it has helped them and their dogs. And it uh, is something that hopefully can help you if you're a listener or you're an existing client and wants to supplement the work we're doing together uh, or just pick up on some pointers with the training you're already doing. Uh, I think there's some great trainers out there, but I think there's also a deficiency in quality training nowadays because of the purely positive movement infiltrating the uh, dog community. And it is not helping our beloved dogs in any way, shape, or form because of the type of thinking and ideologies that it promotes. So um, let's get into it because we are going to talk purely positive with this. Uh, trick training, right? This is more of like if you want to teach your dog to give you a high five, you want to teach your dog to do even tasks so it can be you know, applied in more serious context. But really trick training or teaching a dog to do anything, even a command, is chaining together information, right? And I'm not gonna use all the proper technical terms. If this was me fresh out of college, you know, 12, 13 years ago, I probably would be able to give you a little more, uh, what do I call it, um, impressive jargon, right? But I'm just gonna try to pull it out of memory or just try to explain it in a, more of a layman's way anyway, just so you can paint a picture of understanding how both dogs and humans learn, because learning theory applies to, you know, pretty much more all of the, the, the animal kingdom just in different or less basic ways and for different motivations, right? So, basically what it is. So I'll give you an example of two ways that I can learn something as a human. So, and I give this example to clients. I, I'll just pick an item in their house and say, let's say I lifted up this, this, this you know, uh, an ashtray. Who has an ashtray? I don't know. Off on your coffee table. And there's a gold, there's a gold nugget under there that's real gold, bona fide, and you tell me I can keep it. And then you tell me, put that ashtray down, put that gold nugget in your pocket, and now open it and there's a, and lift it up and there's another gold nugget. And at some point, I'd say within three to five rounds, if not after two, I'm gonna realize there's some pattern developing here and that there's something in it for me because I'm motivated by something that will keep me alive, which is financial resources that gives you human resources, right? That's why we work and some people take it too far. That's why they're unhappy with too much excess. But anyway, with dogs, same thing, food is money. So. If you're a dog and someone says sit and they start either luring you, and I'll talk about luring in a moment here, but they're just, you know, it, or you just do something and every time you hear that word or that sound like a clicker or a bell or a noise, whatever it is, and you do something at some point when you get a flavor or some kind of reward or confirmation, you're going to put two and two together. And then you're going to start doing it more immediately, almost in anticipation, which is not good. And that's what purely positive training does is creates too much anxiety in dogs through the training by thinking 10 steps ahead. Again, don't want to get off topic. Um, but really, you know, it's basically because it's learning theory. You figure out a cause and effect based on a cue that leads to some kind of outcome for you, positive, negative. Now, let me give you the other, and everyone knows this analogy. I go, and you learn this as a kid in some way, shape, or form, if not in this example, another. Um, I go, touch the oven, and when I see a red burner, that means it's gonna hurt me. Now, that'll probably take one time to learn that, if not even just by someone telling you by the understanding of what hot is, right? But human, uh, dogs don't have, or animals don't have the uh, convenience of, of language, so we have to make it, so, and it's not a pain base. I'm just giving an example, and this is what negative, the negative reinforcement does, or negative 
punishment. But I don't use the terms. I just that's dog. It's just how it is. You just understand it if you're around them enough. Um, because people jump on you for not using the exact term, blah, 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 screw you, right? So uh, you get that, and that's how dogs can learn. But I don't like the consequence because a lot of people are too much all punishment. I'm not a fan of that either. I've seen that. It shuts a dog down. It makes him mistrust the handler. Uh, and it just overall doesn't give a dog a clear message of what you expect. So you want to teach a dog to, to walk properly, right? You put a pinch collar on or a choker, which I don't love the chokers. I'm not trying to qualify myself. It's just certain tools I do and don't use based on using them all and knowing to me what works best and seems to be safest for the dogs based on a lot of experience using them, right? So dog pulls without any other clear message. You just learn when you get to the end of the leash, I tug on it. At some point you're gonna learn as a consequence, you're gonna cut yourself off before you get to that point where the consequence comes. That's how invisible fences work. That's how a lot of e-collar trainers do where they're not really shaping the behavior first. Um, and that you can learn, but it is gonna cause detrimental side effects while the learning is there. So that's why a lot of trainers will get results. A lot of e-collar trainers do this. They just crank up the collar. Dogs are gonna listen. But if you put a gun to my head, I'm gonna listen right away too because I understand the consequences. I wanna avoid them at all costs because I'm fearful. It's not out of a mutual understanding and just learning. Like if you learn something, you just know it and you do it right readily and comfortably because it's just your norm because you took the time to chain and scaffold together the understanding of what you're learning. So let's talk about how this would apply the tricks, okay? Let's say I wanna teach a dog how to go put their nose on a, on a target. So let's say I have a little, you know, like a little plastic thing on the ground and I want to show the dog touch. Just again, I don't do this. I'm just off and on the fly here, just kind of giving some kind of, you know, stream of consciousness examples. And you tell your dog touch and you lure him. Now you may be able to get a dog if you're close enough to understand where you're pointing or where you're putting the treat. And, or what you have to do is start chaining together. So you get them closer and closer, like a breadcrumb trail. You put the, the tree a little closer, and every time they get a little closer to that target after hearing touch, you give them a treat, you click it with a marker, you just let them, and then what they learn is when they hear the word touch, they go do that and they get a reward, right? And that becomes just conditioned. And the certain dogs and breeds can learn many, many of these, hundreds, or I think, I think hundreds, right? Border Collies, these very intelligent breeds can do endless tasks, right? And you can chain together like touch, go get, like they'll do multiple things in a row, which can be good for like agility where they learn patterns for some kind of final outcome. In everyday life, again, I think it's more for a dog to be more conscious in the moment when they're focusing and, and, and being in command mode because it creates a calm or meditative kind of synaptic neutral state of mind versus an overexcited anxious type of one. A high synaptic activity is another one of those $2 words. Um, so that's how you would teach absolutely anything. Now some things like, how do I get my dog to give me paw? Well, they don't understand what shaking is. Humans, there was a point where we didn't shake hands because we didn't hide weapons. We were a little more basic. We didn't even carry weapons, right? But then we start realizing, ooh, most people have a weapon in their right hand because we were a little barbaric back in the day. When we meet, we're gonna do this hand. I'm kind of waving my hand out in front of you guys. And it means that I'm not bearing a weapon so I can trust you and be at ease. Dogs sniff each other's butts to my, you know, understanding because they're seeing that they can trust each other back there and then when they play there's no sneak attacks you know they can kind of see where they stand and there's none of this kind of weird out, outlier type of way of operating you know in their social interactions um, so you know anyway getting back to the shake so you may have to get lucky you say shake or you do something with your hand or you reach something the dog kind of puts their arm you know their paw out boom good Yes, give him the treat, right? And eventually, you gotta, and also, as I said, you don't do this all in one shot. You do a couple minutes a day, you build it, and you end on a high note. But until they are proficient in it, you wanna do it in short, brief sessions and motivate them to wanna do this, especially if this is a trick training, something that is not really an applied training situation where socialization, real life obedience, where it just has to happen, you know, to at times save their life or help them cope with everyday life in a balanced way. That's more imperative that you gotta do it till the job zone, where if you're teaching a dog a skill, even when I do a recall, you wanna chain together and scaffold together this understanding with the kind of motivation that allows a dog to, at some point in the future, do it without any teaching required and randomly. So even if weeks or months go by, the dog has that skill set. Same way as if we had learned two plus two equals four, we have a concept of it and it's just kind of an automatic response. Even if we don't understand how math works, our brain just automatically goes to four if someone had asked us that. And that's what you want to get for at least, I'd say most importantly, real life commands. But if you want to teach your dog how to do anything, skateboard, agility, the, the shake we were talking about, this is how you do it. You just have to build together 
the information in their brain, but it is more like programming a computer. There's not really much emotion to the teaching process. Yeah, you give them praise, you get excited, they feel it, but then you have to turn it right off. It's just a moment by moment timing and consistency thing. Um, and then you, you know, it just becomes more of a norm standard. And then maybe you do some practice, like so they're not rusty. But more or less, once it's set in their mind, especially if you teach them as a puppy where they're brains fusing and all the synaptics are connecting synaps synapses synapses are connecting uh, that that's why I stress it when I have a young dog because you have a nice window of opportunity to make this by the book um, okay so I really hope that makes sense because a lot of people don't quite understand and I'm finding even the you know the clicker trainers the purely positive people that their whole modality of training is based on this thing that I'm explaining they don't even understand or know how to articulate it, or that's all they do understand, and they don't know the balance of how learning theory works, and that's why dogs are limited in their ability to improve, you know, apply what they do learn in real life settings. You know, I've seen recently where dogs, they, oh, this dog's got a recall. I'm like, you're inside of an indoor space that's controlled where you taught them, so you haven't even, even proofed the dog to listen anywhere but that place without any external distractions. But you're saying your dog's mastered a recall? Put them in the field with, you know, with a bunch of dogs between you and them in a hundred foot gap with all other types of sights, sounds, and senses, and uh, sensory experiences. Uh, it's going to be a different story, right? Right. All right. Guys, I tell you, I try my best to keep this rolling. It's stream of consciousness isn't easy, but um, I want to get that info. I want to keep it on topic, I'm trying to stay focused, trying to keep my ADD in check here. Okay, so I really hope this makes sense. And I also, you know, I don't need to justify myself. I've done the work I do. I have enough real people in the real world telling me every day that what I'm doing is helping them. I'm not insecure about it like maybe I used to be as a younger dog trainer. But, you know, this is what your big, purely positive thing is, dummies. And you're the first ones to go ahead and criticize guys like me and other balance trainers. Like, we just don't get the science. We do get the science. We understand it very well. We're just very rational and we have enough dog experience to have a greater understanding of what dogs are about and how humans misinterpret them than the people who, through their confirmation bias as so-called professional dog trainers, are making these misinterpretations and then now perpetuating this and passing the information on to dog owners who are just completely innocent in this and poor dogs who cannot speak for themselves and articulate, hey, morons, you're not communicating right. Get the friggin' harness off of me. Stop loading me with treats and have me listen because you understand how I operate and you understand how my instincts work and the relational end of it and the conditioning, okay? Okay, I had to go on a rant about purely positives for, for a little bit in the show. Okay, so um, just to recap, Conditioning, you if you want to teach your dog something, you have to associate an action with a task, and you sometimes have to build or lure that dog into the final outcome, which is that task or combined task if you want to do more advanced work with the dog. Um, through that, once a dog learns, and I don't really think it's great to correct a dog for not doing something like giving you paw or not you know, jumping through a hoop, um, you know, versus like if a dog's been taught to heal and they don't heal, you can correct them for not you know, complying. Uh, but you can definitely be consistent as far as, no, I'm not going to stop until you do this, or I'm not going to give up our teaching process, and I'm going to go day after day and be patient and be consistent about it till you get what I'm trying to teach you. Quite frankly, some dogs are just quicker learners than others, or some dogs have some distractions you know, in their life or social limitations that may get in the way of the things you want to teach them that are a little more fun. You know, if your dog, you want to teach him how to surf like the cool dogs you see on YouTube, but your dog can't handle being at the beach because they're scared of people or, or the water freaks them out or the other dogs passing by, well, let's start with step one. And then maybe in the future, maybe down the road in a year or so, you can start getting on that board and hanging ten with them, right? But let's be rational. This is like people who mask their, their, their psychological issues with wealth and hard work or, yeah, he's a great, you know, uh, sports player, but he's, a, he's, a, he's an anxious wreck. Good, keep playing sports, but let's go to the root of this anxiety so you have a more balanced life. And we're all working on that. I'm not perfect. I just give you examples to my own life experiences and my understanding of how dogs operate and their parallels and differences from us as humans and our psychologies and how the two intertwine. Ta da 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 da. Okay, so let's see here. Um, usually we do about 20 minutes here on the show, so I think we're close to it. Uh, sometimes you'll hear a little cut every now and then because I'm in the car doing this a lot. We'll get an interruption or I get to my destination, so we have to hit pause and then 
kind of spliced together where I left off. So again, support the show. Go on patreon.com backslash the dog savant, T-H-E-D-O-G-S-A-V-A-N-T. Support me and I will get a better quality podcast for you because I will have the ability to set up a studio. Um, I don't need it, but it would be nice. Um, with that, you can also please, again, go on iTunes, subscribe, review, leave a nice one, share, go on social media and follow me at The Dog Savant. I love Instagram. I've been posting some good stuff and I'd like to share with you and I like getting the motivation to keep this social media podcasting thing going uh, because I like knowing that the information is helping you as a dog owner or if you're a client listening to this and it gives you some more information that helps the work we're doing or you're entertained by this, good. If you just are interested in hearing the way I live my life and it motivates you or is into whatever, good. I want to make people feel good with the experience I've had in sharing them. And uh, all right, so with that said, uh, let's see, maybe we can get a question. Let's see, I have some questions. I always keep a list of questions here in my car in case I decide to do one of these. I'm driving, so pardon me for shuffling. Oh, as always, we got a potty training one. Boy, is potty training a thing. So, um, I know to potty train, I mean, I've talked about this a thousand times, guys, but I know I should be potty training my eight-month-old puppy better. It sounds like, based on your previous podcast I've listened to, I'm giving him too much freedom too soon, but I am afraid of a crate because I feel it is mean or abusive, or he's not getting enough movement slash exercise in the day if I keep him contained in that space. Okay, that's a real common concern. I mean, most puppy owners don't love having to put their dog in a small box for multiple hours a day. Um, here's how I explain it. First of all, dogs have instincts, right? So if you get a dog used to the crate early, you feed them in it, they get used to more structure when they're out of it, the crate is actually a place where they can take a break and get into a semi-hibernation state of mind where they relax, they just feel like they're kind of chilling on the beach with a margarita. Life is grand, right? Why? Because they know when they're in the box, there's nothing out of the box that they have to worry about because you will from not only telling them when the next time to be out of the crate, but when their next meal is, when their next walk is, when their next petting on the head is, when their next action is, because that's the ease of being a dog. You don't have to assess anything going on in the human condition unless you're protecting or in an imbalanced situation where you're overprotecting or insecure because no one's covering those bases. So that's what a kennel should represent. Now, how do we offset the fact that a dog will be in a kennel more as a puppy than we will want or will have them as, as adult dogs in the future? Take them on longer walks. Give them more exercise. Give them the attention when they're out of the crate. Have the crate in the same room with you throughout the day, but it does make their instincts tell them that when they're in this smaller space, they have to hold it. And then what happens is once they build some of that ability and the dogs learn to go outside on command, do their business, and then hold it longer and longer with or without the crate because you're building that skill with a more obvious tool like a, like a kennel, they will see your house in the same fashion. And dogs still like crates, so you can keep your dog as a little space to go in. If you travel, you have it and they're used to it. But, you know, it's really our issue that gets in the way of a dog's ability to just acclimate to the crate and see it as a safe, comfortable place. And we do the accommodations and we're using it more frequently and more time in it for a few weeks, you know, to teach a dog better potty training ability. But then it's just an investment. And if you take the time to walk your dog and make them tuckered out, your dog should be laying around, not really moving much in the house anyway. So what's the big deal that they're in a kennel if it's a comfortable space and they feel secure in it? And then they're gonna learn how to hold it and be clean and more convenient for you as well. So, you know, it's really how I tend to reason with it with my clients because by nature, people always want what's best for their dog, but sometimes through our concern for that, we, we, we mess them up even more. And we create an issue that down the road puts more stress on them to resolve. So I hope that made sense to you. Um, with that, please keep sending in your questions. My email is dogtrainingla at gmail.com. My website's dogtrainingla.com. On social media, you can reach out to me. Uh, sometimes it's a little tricky. I don't get the messages all the time, but please try at mention me, all that good stuff. Um, but thanks for your question. I love it. This is good. I like being able to share this because I'm sure there's many other people who are having this experience and can hear that you're not alone. And the type of advice that I give people that go through this in my real world, you know, in the real world with my clients, uh, that may help you too if you're listening. Okay, so 
um, keep that doing coming. Uh, all right, thanks again, guys, for listening. Uh, this has been episode 50 of the Dog Savant Podcast, and everyone have a great day. Bye, everyone.